And we're in. Hello, music to people. Hello, Facebook. Um, I'm Andrew, and I'm here with the wonderful Amara. Hi, Amara. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Okay, we've just had a crazy two minutes where we uh, solved the problems of the world before we came live. Yeah. We're, we're glad to see you all. I mean, so what is the purpose of today? The purpose of today is we are this community of growing um, playlist curators, I and mean, we are growing super fast. I think mean, we've got about 150 applications waiting to come on board. But we are nothing without the artists who are finding us and submitting their tracks and that we work with to promote the tracks. It really is this symbiotic relationship between curator and artist. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, um, what I wanted to find out and what we wanted to get inside was what's it like when you are you know, an artist who would love to be making a living through music, but the world has changed and the, you know, the digital world, what's it like? And Amara, <laughs> who had gone through the process, and we had swapped some email, and I was like, you know what? It would be great to chat with her to see what the experience has been like. Mm -hmm. So before we get into that, Amara, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, how you ended up as your musician, what, what that journey's been like. So yeah, yeah. Well, uh, my name is Amara, and my music name is Little Sailboat. And a, a little bit of background. So I'm one of six children. Uh, I'm number four of the six. And uh, I grew up in a family that was surrounded by music. So my mom was a music teacher, and my dad is actually a, a classical organist, uh, which you don't find very often. Uh, so uh, he, that's not his full-time job, but that, but that is something he did on the side. Uh, and so I was surrounded by music. My brothers were drummers. I have a sister who's an oboist. I have a sister who's a harpist. Um, and I have a couple siblings that have dabbled in music themselves, trying to figure out if it's something they want to do. Um, but it's really just been a, a love in my life since I was very small. Uh, I grew up playing piano. I played flute. Uh, elementary through high school. I was in dance. I did uh, tap jazz, ballet, um, and I picked up the guitar in in high school just because you know that was the cool instrument, and I wanted I wanted the cool instrument. <laughs> so yeah. I picked that I picked that up in high school, and um, it was just amazing to me. I did not even consider songwriting until college. And I think the big part of that was because I was surrounded by all this beautiful music. And to me, I didn't know if I could make anything that was up to that caliber. I didn't know if I could actually reach, um, I, if I could actually make good music because there is so much good music already out there. Uh, and so it wasn't until college that I remember hearing two good friends of mine playing guitar in a dorm room and they were writing a song. And I walked in and I was like, oh, I would love to be able to write music. And they were like, well, why can't you? Why can't you write music? And the one thing I've uh, that people who are close to me know is that um, I'm always up for a challenge. I played sports growing up, and um, there's just this competitive nature in me uh, that people don't always expect because they meet me and they see they, they see like sweet, sweet, kind Amara, and they don't see that little competitive like wanting to win, wanting to succeed um, necessarily in me. Uh, and so that was a challenge, and I was like okay, I'm going to write music. And so uh, throughout my college years, I wrote a lot of bad songs. <laughs> like it, was, it was a lot of just like horrible melodies, uh, cheesy lyrics. I, I, do, I did keep some of them because some of them were just too precious to, to, to trash. Um, and actually one of my piano tracks, uh, Barefoot, is one of my uh, favorite piano solos. And I wrote that in college. It was one of my first piano solos that I wrote. Um, and I wrote that for me. That was me um, trying to work through the stress of college and trying to figure out um, how to process everything that was happening. And it came out through song, um, not lyrically, but but musically. Uh, and so I, throughout those college years, I was getting introduced to all this kind of music I had never been exposed to before. Uh, Regina Spector, I'm a huge fan of her. I was introduced to her in college. Um, Ingrid Michaelson was another one. Um, uh, Imogen, uh, Imogen Heap, did I say that right? I think so. 
I, that's always how I called her and I love her music too. Uh, and so those are three people that I really look up to. And I think the common thread that I've tried to, um, I don't want to say mirror, but at least admired is the fact that they were all um, expressing themselves and they were all deciding to do something a little different. Um, and so I took that and I was like, you know, I want to express myself and I want to do it in a way in which I have not seen or heard before. And so um, one of the things that's been really interesting post-college and writing more music and experiencing more life and, and processing more of that life through song is that uh, people do say I'm different, but then they're quick to like try to categorize me. And so that has been interesting because I, I I might be the only musician like this. I don't I, well no, there's probably other musicians like this, but um, I don't like being categorized. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but I write more than just solo piano. I write acoustic folk, and I've been trying to do a little bit of uh, like. So let's let's have a look. So. We came in contact because there was, I mean, you've got the, the 15, the album you released in 15, which was what? Um, Dia track? Dialogue um, right. is the name of that EP, yeah. Which is which is super cool. And I've fallen in love. I think it's um, it's the uh, Baby Bluebird track. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's something about that that just, I and mean, this is the, the miraculous thing about music, isn't it? I mean, you never really know as a songwriter. Yeah. You know, what's going to resonate. Um, but there's something about that track that just, I don't know, it resonates with me. And I think it, it resonates with, with you know, plenty of other people. But then you've also got your recent release, which is uh, acoustic guitar, and you're singing on it. I mean, there's that, there's that musician in you coming out. But let's, let's just, so how many years are you out of college now? So um, I'm 28, so I've been out of college. Oh, can I count? I graduated from college. Can I count? As, <laughs> is that six years? <laughs> what do you do for a living? How do you, you know, how do you exist? What? Yeah, so I was a teacher for three years. My undergrad was in elementary education. And then um, I stepped out of that, and now I'm in a university setting. Um, and I work, I do administrative type work in a um, university setting. Okay, yeah. so for, I mean, we come across, you know, hundreds and thousands. We're getting about 1,500 track submissions a month at mm -hmm. Music Theory at the moment. Um, and I've been that musician, you know, as a businessman or even an executive, you know, that you get home in the evening and everybody else is in the pub, but you're actually behind the piano with headphones on, you yeah. know, because that's what you really want to do. And I think this is where, I, you know, I, I want to now steer us a little bit because, there are thousands and tens of thousands of people like you, like me, who, you know, you go to college, you get a day job, but there's that internal musician. And, mm -hmm. and the musician's like, I would so much rather be making music for a living and playing. I don't want to be a millionaire. I don't want to be, you know, massive. But if I could make a, a livable income mm -hmm. as a musician, living and breathing music and putting it out and, you know, doing that, that's the holy grail, isn't it? I mean, that would be mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. So if we take you as an example of that, talk to me. So you put your first album out. That was mm -hmm. three years ago. Um, what, was the, what was the result of that? What happened? Um, it did not receive the recognition that I wanted. Uh, so when I graduated from college, I realized that like I wanted to play for people. And so I played in coffee shops and cafes. Um, but what I figured out pretty quickly is uh, I only have a small group of friends. I'm, I'm on the scale, on the introvert, extrovert scale. I'm just like a sliver extroverted. So enough to get me on a stage to sing for people. But um, but then the introvert in me is like, like get back in the room by yourself. Um, <laughs> and so um, I only had a small group of friends. And so I would go to all these cafes and coffee shops and try to get people to come to my shows. And it was always a very small group that came. And so um, I released that EP and, and was hoping that it would catch fire. But what I realized is that um, I just didn't have the network. I just did not have a group of people that was willing to 
push that song out on my behalf. I had a few really loyal friends that were like, Amara is great. But beyond that, it, it didn't, it didn't right. catch. And I think this is, I mean, look, this is the reality of everybody. It's this world that we've been brought up in where, you know, the impossible is possible. And when we teach our kids and we teach the culture, you can be anything and the dream can happen. But the harsh reality is that's true, but 99.99999% of the time, there's a machinery behind yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Do you get, how do you get found? I mean, there's hardly A&R for, you know, classical or, you know, experimental or what they would call new age piano. Mm -hmm. you know, hanging out in every you know town in in america let alone you know, even in the big cities so what do you do so you've released an ep there's five mm -hmm. tracks going on it there's a track that that i think has potential to be heard by a much wider audience but nobody knows mm -hmm. what did you do next um i pouted <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, I pouted, and then um, I I actually had um, some some health issues. I was going up and down with my health, uh, and uh, was trying to figure that that all out. And um, I just realized that I needed to keep writing, and so that's what I did. I just kept writing because for me, writing was a release of emotions and was really healthy for me. So um, after the EP, you know, failed on me. Um, I was just like, you know what? Uh, I love writing music. I love sharing music. If I stop, my personality and who I am as a person will change. And I don't want that to happen because I've seen people who have given up on their dreams and given up on what they love. And they just kind of become bitter and, and angry and, and they lash out at people because and, and I didn't want to be that person. So. I kept writing, I kept going to small coffee, I go to open mics a lot. I stopped doing shows because I only had a couple people showing up, but I kept going to open mics and like trying to show people what I what I do. Um, but then, I don't know if you want me to go into this now, but I had this like moment, uh, I think it was back, it was back in February, I think. Um, so Spotify for Artists, I think launched just this past fall, right? Yeah. So I saw that happen and I looked at it and I was like, wait a second, they're letting me be verified without a certain amount, a certain amount of followers. Like that changes everything. Well, hang, with, hang about there's there, there's a step before that. So you released your EP, but when you released it, what did that mean? Did you how did you distribute it? CD Baby or TuneCore or CD Baby? CD Baby. Yeah. And did you pay for pro distribution or do you just, you know, one EP out? I did pro, so it was on all the streaming services, but it didn't look professional. Um, I wasn't able to edit any of the content that was in the Spotify portal. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but you um, you registered with ASCAP or BMI to pick up um, your royalties at all? So I mean, the with the Performing Rights Association. Yeah. So um, uh, BMI, I think, right. is is with who I'm with. Yep. Okay. So your tracks out everywhere, but you're just not getting the streams because mm -hmm. so did you what about social media? What about Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and you know all of that? I mean, did you how did you use them? So um, I put a lot of stuff out on YouTube and that slowed down, too, because I was starting to get some trolls coming through and, and, and disliking everything on my YouTube. And so that slowed down for me. That was really discouraging because um, I had put a bunch of stuff out on YouTube at one point. Um, uh, Facebook, I, I always felt like Facebook, like I would try to put, put things out on Facebook, but it never felt like it picked up. Like it, I, I wasn't sure how many people were actually seeing it. Um, it, like I, well, it has the number. It shows like five people have seen this, but like, I, I wasn't sure how to get more people to see it. What I didn't necessarily want to pay, uh, cause I don't have the money to pay. <laughs> the vast majority. Yeah. I mean, were you aware of, you know, the basic Facebook algorithms or how, you know, pages work and the likelihood of how that post gets into the news feed and streams and the fact that Facebook has been changing everything yeah. pretty much every six months over the last three years? I mean, it's a lot for an artist who's got a day job and who's also mm -hmm. making music to stay on top of, isn't it? 
Yeah, it really is. I and honestly, I don't even know the algorithms that get used for Facebook. Um, and honestly, I have to, I uh, posting wise, I'm limited on, on when I can post because it depends on when I'm working. So. So Facebook wasn't a great channel. Um, Instagram didn't really start kicking off until about two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, did you use Twitter at all? So Twitter has been my holy grail. Um, I've realized that more people interact on Twitter and more people um, are willing to share things on Twitter than they are on Instagram and Facebook. I, I, I feel like it's very much a vomiting feed. People just like, like they just, they just let it all out on Twitter versus Facebook and Instagram. People feel like they need to be much more polished and, and they're much less likely to give shout outs on Facebook because it's, it's become more of a monumental platform. Like I got married, um, I had a baby. So um, I've found that, that few people actually want to post things for me on their Facebook or Instagram because it feels out of place with what the platform is showcasing. So this idea that as an independent artist with a limited amount of time, this was the new world. You could use CD Baby or any other distributor. You could be in every digital store on the planet and you had social media, you had Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all you needed to do was push your stuff out and everybody would listen. And still more pouting no more but i pouted yeah i'm really good at pouting i have a great pouting face <laughs> <laughs> so then so you go through that process mm -hmm. and, but you're still writing you're still trying so now let's take us up to spotify for artists so what did mm -hmm. that yeah, so um, back in the fall, I released um, a acoustic single called The Meadow and Sparrow. Mm -hmm. And um, after I released that, uh, Spotify for Artists came and I was like, I can make myself look like a real musician. That was the hard part about pri prior to Spotify for Artists is it made you look like a fraud um, when you weren't verified. Like it, it, it it just looks sketchy, you know? And so once um, I was able to get verified with, with the amount of follower, followers that I had, which I think was like two, um, <laughs> and the amount of listeners I had back in January was like two. I had two people listening. Um, prob probably one of them was me. <laughs> probably one. Um, but then in G February, so I, I started verifying my account. I got really excited. Christmas happened. New Year's happened. And then um, NPR. Are you feel, uh, familiar with? Um, OK, so NPR has a tiny desk contest. And I submitted to the tiny desk contest with my song to the water. And there was a Facebook group that was created um, just for contestants, just for people who submitted. And I joined that Facebook group and I noticed something really interesting. Everybody was posting their stuff, but nobody was really interacting with the other posts. So they were, listen to me, another post, listen to my stuff, another post, like, hey, I'm really great, listen to my stuff, but nobody was interacting with each other. And so I, I did one of those posts, I posted my piano EP and I was like, I'm really great at the piano, listen to me. And um, one person did listen to me and they gave me a suggestion that changed the course of, of what I've been doing. Um, he, he, I can't remember if it was a he or a she, but they basically said, have you ever thought about um, submitting this to a playlist? And I was like, what do you mean? Submit to a playlist, tell me more. And uh, they were like, and they said YouTube. They said, you know, YouTube has a bunch of playlists. Um, you should see if you can reach out to one of them and submit to one of them. Well, that got my brain going. And in particular, like I jumped to Spotify because Spotify for artists had happened in the fall. So, so I was like, now that I'm this more verified person on Spotify, because I'm not verified on YouTube. Um, I don't have enough uh, followers to be ver verified on YouTube. So um, I was like, I wonder if I'm pitchable to playlists now. And so what I did is in that as an experiment, and also because I just love people and I love music, I posted in that group. I, I will never forget it. I was so nervous. My heart was pounding and I was like, should I do this? I don't know. Um, and I posted in the group, hey, I think we should help each other out. I'm going to create an NPR tiny desk contest playlist and anybody who wants to be on it, 
comment below with your stuff and I'll put it on the playlist. And not gonna lie, hundreds of posts. It was crazy. Not all the posts were um, Spotify. Some of them were YouTube because I did offer both. I said, hey, I'll put on, I'll do a YouTube playlist and I'll do a Spotify playlist. And more people did YouTube because not everybody has stuff on Spotify. And so I created these two playlists and it was amazing. The community that came out of that was just crazy because because I was putting putting them on playlists, all of a sudden people were willing to listen to other artists. And um, I, I loved it. And I tried to advocate as much as I could. I was like, hey guys, when we listen to the playlists together, we're helping each other out. And the more people who do this, the better it is for everybody. Um, and so I'm competitive, but I also love people. And so I think when it comes to this music industry, I've never been one to want to elbow someone out of the way. If they have something to say, they should say it. Um, and because of that, I think um, I've probably been, I probably haven't gained as much success because I care for people. Um, but I loved, I absolutely love the community that came out of that. And it received enough of a response that um, I believe that Bob Boylan, is that his last name? Yeah. Bob Boylan. Um, he, I, I think he listened to the playlist, the, the, the guy behind the NPR Tiny Desk contest. And so it creates, so because of the wave that we created um, together, you know, each of us, here's an analogy, right? We're each a drop. Like how many people are going to look at a drop of water, but together, like we created this wave and all of a sudden this person in a higher position in the music industry was like, Whoa, like what's this wave that is coming at me. And um, he listened to the entire wave. And so all of us drops got a chance to be heard. So, so that's what got me started on this playlist thing is I, um, I saw the success of that and I was like, I love community. I love music. I love the idea of connecting. And so Twitter became a way for me to connect with all these people that I'm from all over the world. I've connected with people from all over the world via Twitter and uh, we're helping each other out. There's a bit of, you know, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. Um, and there has been some funkiness. I, I don't think everybody approaches this the same way that I do. I think there is a little bit of the, um, I have felt some funny vibes from some people that just want to take advantage of the entire thing and, and get as high up the... the, the well, it's the, possible, for sure. Yeah, and, and I don't blame them for that. Um, it's not a bad thing to want to be successful, but... I've, I've loved the, I guess all that to say, I've loved the community of it. And I've loved the, the fact that I've now, I now know more artists and have listened to more artists and have a larger um, group of, a larger group of music to listen to. And I've also been listened to at the same time. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a brilliant and, um, you know, kudos to you for, you know, taking the idea and the initiative and making it to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so just a, a quick question. We got a question from George. You know, do um, do you both charge to post your music, and is there a way to make money doing this as a starting artist? So here's here's the thing, because um, I, I do want to go down this road. Yeah, is the the goal of you know the majority of people who have a day job, but who are out there recording music and posting it is to be able to generate enough money from their music so they don't have to have a day job. I mean, that's, that's what we all want. Yeah. And how do you do that? The, the harsh reality is that unless you are established, unless mm -hmm. you have an audience, you cannot put a paywall in front of them. Mm -hmm. You can't charge people to listen to your music because they don't know you, they don't care. So, you have to give your music, you have to put your music up onto the streaming platforms, you know, whether it's YouTube or Spotify or Deezer or whatever, um, in order for people to listen to it and to fall in love with it. And then so they listen to it more and they share it with other people and they get behind it and so on and so on. And then your audience builds. So <clears throat> there are two 
there are not unscrupulous, unscrupulous, but there are actually some unscrupulous places where you can go and you can pay two hundred and fifty dollars as an artist, and you can get yourself placed on playlists that have twenty five thousand subscribers or whatever, mm -hmm. and you end up with I don't know seventy five streams that doesn't move the needle at all because they're bought and paid for. They're mm -hmm. out in the Philippines or they're somewhere you know ridiculous, and it's. It's there are no shortcuts in the music industry anymore. Yeah, and it takes time. So we don't. So let's let's bring it back to your story. So you're coming along. You've been um, um, Spotify for Artists came out. You're authorized. You've got your first playlist. You suddenly recognize the power of the playlists. You've got community. How then did you end up finding about music too? Um, it's really interesting. Uh, Twitter. So I'm, I, I'm one of those people where like, I'm not going to do the follow unfollow thing. Do you know how people do that on Twitter where they're like, I'm going to follow you. So you pay attention to me and then, oop, <laughs> I'm not following you anymore. <laughs> I'm like, I don't do that. Um, just because if I choose to follow you, like there's, there's a reason, um, behind that. And so what's been really awesome and really fruitful from me choosing to stay followed to a bunch of artists that are similar to me, because I've started looking up composers and started to see who else was out there, is um, a lot of people advertise the playlist that they've been placed on. And so um, they will get placed and then they'll tweet out like, thank you to Music2 for placing me on this particular playlist. Now, the interesting thing is I think the the essay the essay writing playlist that particular feed I think liked one of my things and I I looked at it and um, looked at the feed and I wasn't sure so you're gonna think you're gonna think this is funny I wasn't sure if it was legitimate or not yet so I it liked something and I looked at it and I was like mm, I don't know because I had submitted to some that wanted me to pay. They wanted me to pay, and and I didn't wasn't sure if this was a playlist that wanted me to to pay because <laughs> I didn't want to pay. <laughs> so yes. um, so I wasn't sure, and then I noticed that some of the people I'd been interacting with on Twitter uh, were were interacting with that feed and with the music too, and I was like, so if they're interacting, it must be legitimate. So I'm going to look into it further, and so then I got into the music too website, and uh, you have that nice little blurb that says uh, before you go any further read this and uh, being the academic that I am so you know elementary education uh, one of the big things that they have you do read everything multiple times <laughs> you know it's the educator I still see myself as an educator um, and so I, I saw the instructions and I was like well I better read the instructions and so I took the time to read it and based off of the way that the instructions were written I was like I do need to make sure I'm sharing my story well uh, in in the way that I submit to this playlist. And uh, honestly, kudos to you because that um, PDF that that um, those instructions made me realize that I do need to make sure I'm sharing my story when I'm when I'm uh, pitching to curators because I have a story that I think is worth telling um, and. I want to make sure that people realize that I'm different. And that's something maybe we'll touch on this later, but so many artists feel like they need to change and mold to what's working in order to be heard. And I'm really rebellious against that. I, I'm like, well, I'm going to be me. And if you don't like me, then I probably shouldn't be on your playlist anyway. Uh, and so um, I've, I've even had interactions, like inbox interactions with other composers. Uh, I had one recently that was like, you know, Amara, you should think about um, writing for a playlist and maybe see what that's like. And um, maybe it's just my approach to songwriting that holds me back. But I, I do write from experience and I write from a, from a, a personal place of emotion. And so... I would really have to feel connected to that playlist emotionally in order to write something for that playlist. There would have to be something that connected me to it in order to trigger a song. I couldn't, I can't just like, boop, there's a song. Like there, there has to be an emotion 
or a connection there? I mean, here, here's some. I mean, here's some really distressing data points. Um, the average listen time for a track submitted to most playlists, the curators, is about 15 seconds. Yeah. And you think of that, and that's ridiculous. There's a company called, there's an entity called Submit Hub, and I like them because any playlist is getting inundated with submissions. And they said, okay, look, we're just going to put a paywall in. I mean, if you want us to listen to the track, you know, you're basically paying for our time to listen to it. Mm-hmm. I see nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. That's fine, but I don't see a lot of good with that because I've been a broke starting artist that has no bloody money, no credit card. I can't, you know, send money, and then of course, then you get into debt because then you're sending any, you know, sending your tracks, yeah. saying yeah. everybody, because this is going to be the one that makes it. So I've always had in my mind that you should never have to pay to submit a track to music to, but then. What filter do you use? And you know, we're developing this as we go. And for me, it's a time thing because you're asking that curator to give you their time and not just 10, 15 seconds because you can't fall in love with a track in 10, 15 seconds. I mean, I have, yeah. to, I have to be two or three minutes into a track before I'm going, you know, I'm just not digging this. And then for me to fall in love with it, I've got to listen to it three or four times and see if I really do like it. And then yeah. when I've got it, Okay, I'm happy to share that out with the world. That's a lot of time. And if you've got, you know, if you're getting three or four track submissions a day, there has to be a way to filter out the people. And what we've arrived at is this equitable time for time thing. So you're right. I mean, that medium article that you read that's at the top of every form, you know, track submission form on music to on all the 40 plus playlists. Mm -hmm. It's an article on medium that I wrote um, at the end of last year and then updated it again this year. That's getting read about 300 times a week, which is interesting. But here's the thing. Out of our 1500 playlist submissions a month, maybe... 200 actually take the time to you know look at the playlist write a compelling story you know make it relevant and take the time to do it because they're like those people that you've already experienced are like i don't care about you i just want to get onto the top of the list spray and pray get my music out to as many people and i don't think that's going to work anymore Mm -hmm. yeah i completely agree with that and i think too um there's a sense of the curator and the people they they feel like they know you. And I feel like you do know me a little bit better based off of um, that chunk uh, that I wrote to you. Um, You probably don't know me super well, but it gave you an idea of like who I am as a person. And like, I wonder, I wonder what she's truly like, you know, like it it, it gave maybe, I maybe put it, I might be putting words in your mouth. (laughs) Actually, you know what cracked me up? And you may, you you may not like this, but I listen to the, I I rarely do it. I happen to be, it was luck, you know, because my time is insane at the moment because I run two lists and I run the essay list and I also run two. Um, And I just happened to be in a space where I was like, oh, you know, and the app was good. You know, okay, so I listened to the EP. And you have a track on there called My Happy Song. Yeah. <laughs> Which is totally your happy song. <laughs> but it's, I mean, I'm listening to going, that's probably, you know, not reflecting you in the light you want to be listened to. And I always get the rest. But then you go through and then, you know, the same um, baby bird came on like, oh, hang about, there's something here. But I gave you my time because there was something in your application that said, give me your time. Mm-hmm. I feel that there's something there. I think there's, um, I think there's an open, this is what we're basically building or growing music to on because, oh, we'll get onto that in a minute. So what's it like with other curators sites? I mean, how many playlists do you have you submitted to or do you, do you, support? <sighs> you know, I, I haven't kept track. I try to submit to a couple a day is what I try to do just because based off my time, the time that I have, that's, that's what I'm able to give. Um, so I, I try to submit to a couple a day and um, I try to make them as personal as possible. And it's, it's been interesting. I had one that gave me kind of an emotional reaction. I, I had to submit my music through this other site 
Um, and I, so, what was it through submit hub? It might have been. It might have been. I can't remember. But it, it was something where I, I got the free version because, again, I didn't want to pay for anything. Um, and I found this person's playlist and I had messaged them on Facebook. Um, she's the only one that's responded to me on Facebook. Everybody else has been responding to me on Twitter. Uh, and she responded back like, hey, you know, submit my, submit to me through through this website. And I did. And I submitted um I didn't submit my happy song because there are very few playlists that are going to want my happy song. Um, children love that song. Children love that song. Um, yeah. And I've played it for children and they love it. They kind of bounce in their seats. Um, so I, I think that song is coming from my elementary education background. Um, but I submitted my four other songs on that EP and I kept getting no's. And finally the last no, she was like, I appreciate your persistence, but the music you're submitting is just not what I'm looking for. And and she said it very nicely. Like she did compliment me and in, in my style, but just said that like my style isn't what she was right. looking for. And um I got I pouted again. <laughs> I pouted. Um and I wish I was just really torn apart because I would love it if a big group of people loved my music. Like I would love it if, if, if there were more people who loved my music than, than hated it. But unfortunately, I think we live in a world where um, there may not be as many people who like, oh, uh, how do I put this? I, I don't think I have a style that everybody will resonate with. I guess that's just a simple way of putting it is, is um, I write music and, and there are times that people are not going to resonate with it. And um, I would love for more people to resonate with it. But I, I really just had to process and, and realize that like she wasn't um, critiquing me as a person. She wasn't tearing me as a person apart. She just didn't like the song. As, as a musician, as a, as a creative, you have to develop one hell of a thick skin. You just do. Yeah. You're gonna all the time. We got another quick comment from George, and I think you already answered this. He says, you know, you create a CD that's great to you. The studio says they love it, but they say to write a radio pop hit to help it sell. That's, that's the old model. And I mean, you wouldn't do that anyway, because it's, it's nuts. I mean, this happens right now. Um, so you take the major playlist, you look at Rap Caviar. So it's got 10 million subscribers, and it's growing. I and mean, all these playlists are growing. Right now, the artist's because, well, here's, here's the, the modern version of writing a hit that's more commercial. With 15 seconds is the average listening time for a track. People mm -hmm. are now rewriting their track to move the hook up into the first 15 seconds so you can catch the listener. So you've got this you know, homogeneity of music because it's yeah. all the sound the bloody same. But the, so the problem is not so much the commercialness or, or you know, all the tracks sounding the same with the hook in the first 15 seconds, because that won't last for long because people are going to get bored. Yeah. And what they're going to go and do is they're going to look for other playlists. And again, this is the music to play. Because mm -hmm. the solution for you is you've got to build an audience. And how mm -hmm. do you build an audience? The only way you're going to build an audience is to be exposed on playlists that have an existing audience where the playlist gives context. And this is the other point that I want to bring out and just, you know, float it with you. you see, music's a smorgasbord now. I mean, this is the interface. Yeah, you know, yeah. What, what if Apple, you open it up, you press the button, and it streams. And there's no context. There's no DJ saying, okay, this track was recorded. It's had a guest bass player. Listen for this bit, and it's super cool. Because we just don't listen to it that way. But we do tend to follow playlists. And what a music to playlist is driven by the personality of the curator. You know, the, the text that you write mm -hmm. gives the curator something to put on the page as well. Because remember, the curator has to write their couple of paragraphs of why they think the track is cool. That unique write-up is what yeah. sends it around in the world and gives the listener a reason to listen to that track. I mean, our model is that we exist in social space first 
So you're aware of a new music track, an essay track too, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook. You get that every week. And mm -hmm. so we're teaching our audience to expect a new track every week. But they don't just listen to it straight away. They'll read the write-up. Why is this track cool? What's the story about it? What's the context? And then when they listen to the track in context, it's super cool. Yeah. It's a hell of a long-term play, and it's, yeah, it's going to take another year. But we're now, the essay writing list is now growing at two or three Spotify subscribers a day. Yeah. That's because it's been alive for a year, and we've grown and trained this audience to go. But it's context. And I expect that artists who really want this have their own website, have their own social media. Mm -hmm. They don't need us to you know, manage your email list or do whatever. You can learn how to do all of that. You can mm -hmm. manage all of the you know, communication with your audience. You just need to be exposed to them. And mm -hmm. that's, that's our model. I mean, what do you think? I, I, so I really like what you guys are doing. Um, one, because... Uh, I noticed that you have curators from all over the world. Uh, yeah. And that's, I think that's really awesome. And I, I do like the fact that you are wanting people to, to give that context in their submissions. Um, can, can you give me a, a little bit more on what you want me to say? Like, no, well, it, it, well, I'd never want you to say anything. That you don't <laughs> want to say, but it, it's more of, so, okay. So, Here's the final model for us. Yeah. Because right now, if you're distributing through CD Baby, you pay them a fee. I think they're taking 10% and you're making 60 cents on the dollar back from the streaming platforms, yeah? Yeah. And because you're not generating you know, any streams at all, you're basically making 60 cents on the dollar of nothing. So the model for us is, and we're, you know, we're fleshing this out at the moment, is for individual curators to sign individual tracks from artists mm -hmm. not an ep not anything but just one track no publishing no licensing none of that just percentage of streaming revenue and because if you signed with an indie label right now you would have to cut a deal on all revenues that you make from your music and if mm -hmm. you're lucky you'd make about 12 and a half cents on the streaming dollar so we think the future is that a track has to be worked so you're the artist that's creating it, but you need to have a partner in how you market that track. You need to have yeah. you know, an interview like this that they share yeah. you know, to their audience, that they promote every day and every week. You become track of the month and you're featured on the playlist for four weeks and yeah. thousands of people that follow that. Yeah. And the offer that we're going to make to the artist is, look, look, give us one track. That's all we're asking for. And if we can break it, then you're made because that's that suddenly grows the audience. Yeah, yeah. And for that, we pay the artist 25 cents on the streaming dollar. But the cool thing is that we pay the curator 25 cents on the streaming dollar. And what that does is you now have this equitable split that it's in the curator's best interest to work with the artist. It's in the artist's best interest to work with the curator. And now you've got this team of two mm -hmm. who are focused on marketing and working the track, getting it out to their audience, pushing it across both channels. We've developed expertise in, you know, Facebook ads, how to set up, you know, warm audiences, custom retargeting. Yeah. You know, we just tried it with an artist. We generated over 35,000 streams of wow. content based around their track. So, and, and we've, got, we've got time to grow, but that's what we're moving towards. How does that mm. sound to you as an artist? I, so I think it goes back to my analogy of the wave and just realizing that like, as a drop, you guys are not just a drop, you guys are a, a stream. And I think what's cool about um, the model that you've, you've um, just proposed is the fact that a, a stream is able to multiply much faster than, than a drop can. So I... I like the idea of partnership. Um, I like the idea of community and, and, and working together because I, I think it creates a level of investments on, on both parties. Both parties want to see it succeed. Um, and I think right now, uh, when people submit to playlists, there's a sense of like, oh, I guess I'll help you out. Um, 
<laughs> there's a certain arrogance of it. Well, it's my playlist, and you you got to be nice to me to get on it. And it's like I, I find that you know not repellent, but it's not pleasant, is it? Yeah, I well, and and as you probably have noted in our interview, I am a little bit more sensitive of a person. So uh, when that kind of exchange happens, I get real stubborn, and I'm just like, mm, like right. I don't know how I feel about you. Um, I'm never angry towards people, but it, it just creates just this weird environment of like music is supposed to be a joyful, wonderful thing. And, but you're being really weird. <laughs> but it's the, you started talking about, you know, you love music, but you love people too. Mm -hmm. And what I have learned over my career is that when you have two humans working together, you do generally, and, and, it's, and it's an equitable reward for both. You do create something that's bigger than the sum of both parts and for the majority of musicians who have day jobs but who want to you know break that mold who want to grow their audience there isn't anybody that you can work with yeah I mean, hey ariel hire inside the pr and i would recommend it if you have the dough because she's freaking awesome but you don't have a grand to drop on you know releasing a single but yeah. if you're hungry and you're prepared to say commit over the launch month that, okay, I'm gonna spend three hours a week working with the curator and the curator commits to that time too. And then you're looking at figures every day and let's push here and let's push there. Yeah. So you have that thing. And if it works, because here's the new model of how to break a track. The, uh, and this figure changes all the time, but the Spotify AI, as I understand it, with my you know, knowledge of the industry, if you can generate 5,000 streams in a day, that's enough and legitimate, not all out of one city in the Philippines. I'm talking with a, a proper geographic spread. Yeah. Of, you know, and their AI can handle that. If you can generate 5,000 streams a day, that's the threshold for Spotify to pull that track onto genre-based Discover Weekly. And that's what we're aiming to shoot for. Yeah, yeah. I think we can do that in about a year's time on the essay writing list because our audience will have grown enough that if we can turn around to an audio, uh, to an artist like you and say, "Hey, let's work together on one track." You know, we take our twenty cents because we're music too, and we have you know overheads and costs and whatever. But of the remaining fifty cents, twenty five goes to the artist, twenty five to the curator. We teach the curator how to you know release this because we're working this all out. You commit your time. We commit the time, and then you break the track. If we can say, look, we can get you to 5,000 streams in a day, which is enough to get you on to Discover Weekly, mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of people, yeah. that's legitimate, and it's real, and it's tangible, and it's the future. Because at that point, if the track is resonant, if the track has that magic, yeah. then then you're on, well, you wouldn't be on Rap Caviar, but you can be on, you know, New Age Piano and suddenly you're at, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 100, 250,000 streams. When you're doing that, not only are you making revenue, yeah, but you have visibility and you have an audience. And then you don't need the music to curate it to release the next track. Then you can go back to CD Baby. Then you get the full one. Or maybe you do want to work with the curator again because it was such a good experience. And then you're building relationships. But it's yeah. based around one track, which is such minimal risk for the artist, and yet the upside is potentially huge. So yeah, that's our future. I like that. I really like that, and I like that it's tangible because I think some of the PR websites I've looked at and some of the um, different uh, music companies that pitch to people like me, their big pitch is we're going to make you a star. You know, we're going to get you out there and we're going to we're going to have you be this big, big thing. And I don't need to be a big thing. Kind of like what we talked about earlier. Um, I would just love to be able to write music for a living and, and be able to live comfortably and comfortably looks different for every person. Right. Um, but but I I'm a very I live very simply. I really do. And so um, the fact that you have a tangible and realistic goal um, rather than um, because there can only be so many stars, right? There can only be so many people who are this idea of the middle class musician, which we all thought was going to happen last decade and you know, still hasn't happened. 
I do think it could happen because mm-hmm. as you have more and more playlists, as you develop more and more niche audiences, and the, the idea of the 1,000 true fans, that was the idea back in, um, you know, it was Amanda Palmer who was, you know, if you had a 1,000 true fans and a 1,000 true fans were dropping 50 bucks on you a year, you know, I mean, that's, that's pretty close, yeah? So, but that doesn't, because for that to happen, you need to sell constant tickets and merch and maybe that's yeah. not it. But streaming is going to, what, 20, $25 billion industry in the next few years? You know, yeah. if you have 20, 30,000 people, and here's the cool thing. If you had a track that broke, yeah, if you hit Discover Weekly and it worked well on Discover Weekly and then you were on to New Age Piano Music, what then happens is that track becomes a legitimate option for licensing, for sync. Somebody hears it and then you're in a commercial and suddenly there's seven and a half grand that you didn't know. And you don't have to share that with anybody. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. Because it's not like the old label deal because we're not fronting the money into you. So, you know, I understand the label economics, which is, you know, you break one track in 100, one artist in 100, so you have to take all the dough out of that artist that makes it. Yeah. Well, that's old school. It's a different economic model. Whereas now, if we break you, sure, we'll get our you know percentage of the streaming revenue, but you as the artist get everything else because that to me seems seems fair. Yeah, I yeah I and licensing. I I was reading something by a composer about the fact that uh, as a musician, you do need uh, three legs to your stool, meaning that you have the streaming leg and you have the licensing leg and then you have the live performance leg um, in order to actually live off your music. And so, um, and you're and you're right about the fact with licensing, I, I don't completely understand that industry yet <laughs> at all. Um, but I do know that they're more likely to discover it if it's if it's got more streams. Um, yeah. It's funny. I mean, the, the I was chatting with um, there was a group who did some promo work on just to establish some baselines. Fiona Joy. I don't know if you know her music. She's yeah. So Fiona's great. And we were um, yeah we did some work with her and her new group Flow. Um, Jeff Foster is you know a successful indie trumpet player. Um, he still sells financial services. You know, and but you know, but he goes and plays trumpet as well. Yeah. But he doesn't see streaming um, as a, a realistic revenue option for him right now because it just never is. Because his his audience is older, and you know, he's making dough out of selling. Um, if, well, he's super switched on. He doesn't sell CDs anymore because I was at, I was at a gig in Dublin two weeks ago. Fantastic guy, and he had his CDs at the merch table, and I brought them home. I'm like. Bugger, I've got nowhere to listen to this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. The only place is in the car. But Jeff's point is that he now sells thumb drives yeah. um, with the album on it, which is super cool. But he sees Spotify and he sees Apple Music as a distribution platform. You know, because he doesn't, he doesn't see it as a way of making money. He sees it as a way of getting in front of an audience. Mm-hmm. So that you know, when he's booking a gig or if he's you know, selling merch, whatever, there's more people who are actually going to buy that. I see it slightly differently. I see money rolling into streaming. I see, you know, streaming getting much more viable. And the, the, having the three legs of your stall, sure, there's sync, there's streaming. I don't think, I think over time, I don't know how long it will be, but the streaming revenue will make up for the kind of people who don't want to tour. And I think that would be awesome. I would, I would love that. <laughs> yeah, but so would loads of people. But, yeah. But, you know, you'll have to work hard. You'll have to get, you know, we said right at the beginning, I mean, artists improve, they get better because they're playing. I mean, the more time your instrument, the more feedback you get, you know, it's, con- it's a constant improvement process. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. We're going to wrap because I got, I just went on so much longer than I thought. It was brilliant. That's okay. I had a super Thank time. You. Was, this you know, was really fun. I love this. This was great. <laughs> Any questions for me or for music to or anything that we didn't touch on that you wanted to touch on before we go? I'm super curious what hooked you about Baby Bluebird, what you loved about it. No idea. No idea? I have no idea. And it's one of those intangible things. It's like I'm, you know, I'll, I'll be yeah, briefly honest with them, but I mean, I'd gone through, um, yeah, I'd come out of my happy song. I was like, 
oh, wow, that's not what I expected, and this is probably not what I'm going to like. And then I listen to the next one, and I'm always, because it's for the essay list, Yeah. I'm always you know, doing something else while I'm listening to that. So I'm not giving it my full attention, which I've had that discussion with a lot of artists. And they're like, what do you mean you're not giving my music your full attention? Yeah. But then you, could, you know that I'm a pianist as well, and I have my own you know, music to work to do. Um, and there was just something about it that... Um, that got me and whether it's the opening um i mean it, it, there's a certain repetition that it was just oh hang about and your ear goes back and this is i listen to an awful lot of music yeah and i'll listen to it and i i know that thing that i look for it's just like you hear your ear going yeah and then you go, oh that was interesting and then i'll listen to it again and the second time i listen to it i will give it my attention yeah and then it's like Okay, I think there's something here, and then I put it on repeat, and then that's I that's awesome. Um, and it, I mean, this morning before preparing you to come and chat to you, I probably listened to that track, you know, twenty, I don't know, twenty, twenty first time, oh, just okay. listening to it because it's one, it's you, and it's the best way I find to get to know an artist is just to listen to. It. In fact, I listened to all the EP, um, yeah, um, before we got in, but. Music's weird, man. <laughs> it really is. It's strange. And trying to dissect it and work out what's going to be a hit. There are people who've got huge businesses in that and they do very well. But I don't know. There's that intangible thing. There are people like you. There's artists everywhere that you know, don't have the money, don't have the influence, don't have the friends who are turning out that weird intangible thing. And if we can create an environment where if they care enough, and that we care enough and we can find that and we can push it out to the world, then that's awesome. All right. That's great. Thank you. This was so much fun. <laughs> Stay on the line after we kill this. We'll have a quick NASA. All okay. right. Uh, Facebook, great. George, thanks for the comments. Um, we will catch you on the flip side. Take Sounds care. Sounds great. Bye.